Good morrow, Newton. I did not expect to find thee abroad so early. Why, father, it is not unusual. My mind is usually so occupied with thoughts stimulated by the writing I do of an evening that I cannot sleep. And even when I do sleep, it is but a brief and uncomforting sleep I have. Why, only last night I was making a commentary on the most profound book of our one and true religion, the Book of Revelations, when I found I could go on no farther. For I could discern not the meaning of that figure, the beast 606 and 60. What thinkest thou thereon? The revelations of St. John, known to the faithful as St. John the Divine, are revelations of matters which defy a rational understanding. For the authors of the books of the Bible and the apostles and the saints desire that every man would be saved. Since all men are rational by nature, these writers would, for any matter susceptible to rational demonstration, provide such a proof. For such proofs would have the power to convince all men of the truth, the Christian doctrine. But St. John provided no such demonstration. Therefore, the matters of which he speaks in the Revelation must be such that no man can learn of them by reason. Turning, Newton, to the matter of your agitation, which prevents you from sleeping. Thinkest thou not that the agitation of soul might be the product of sin, whose torments and temptations permit thee no rest? Perhaps, my son, thou needest confess and cleanse thy soul, which would permit thee to have peaceful, refreshing sleep. Or perhaps the Creator wishes to acquaint thee with the splendors of his creation, so that thou, who wouldst leave no role for him but as prime mover who sets the universe in motion, and then intervenes not in its actions, and alters not its course for good, nor acts to save those unhappy souls who repent their sins, might observe the beauties of what he makes, and know that he is constantly present everywhere. And is not morning the best time to impress this on the sinner's heart? For can there be any pleasanter time of day, that purple sky, these wild but sweet notes of birds, the fragrant bloom upon the trees and flowers, the gentle influence of the rising sun, these and a thousand nameless beauties of nature do inspire the soul with secret transports, whose faculties, being at this time fresher and livelier than any other time of the day, are better fitted now for those meditations which the solitude of a garden and tranquility of the morning naturally dispose us to than other times. But, Father, thou givest evidence thou dost not understand my principia, and thy failure to understand does lead thee to blaspheme against him who is the source of all that exists. For thou dost claim that my philosophy demands that God be not free to intervene in the course of universal history whenever he wills. But his will and our will are on alike. For we know imperfectly and could decide only by observation whereto the universal course of events is leading and can formulate our wishes only in response to our observations. But he knows perfectly and can foresee all incidents in the course of universal history even before the first event occurs, and hence can so arrange it that all sinners who repent of their sins will be saved. To put it otherwise, thou considerest of God's will from the standpoint of time, but he is not in time, but for all eternity. Thine arguments, Newton, as a characteristic of the products of such a finely operating and much exercised mind as thine own, are powerful ones. They do not, however, convince, for they are based on ideas of eternity and infinity that are all of a materialistic turn. Thou considerest God's existence to be like the existence of matter, and so becomest embroiled in contradiction. Pray tell, Father, what be those contradictions? Leave me not in error confounded, but show me my mistakes and I will repent of them. 
But bear in mind, as thou formulatest thy thoughts, that that most profound saint of the church, Saint Augustine, who was uh, Bishop of Hippo, supports my arguments, as is demonstrated in his chapter in De Civitate Dei, entitled, Against Those Who Would uh, Assert That Things That Are Infinite Cannot Be Comprehended By The Knowledge Of God. Be wary and remember that that most splendid of saints there proposed for the first time in human history the notion of the first transfinite cardinal. So, Bishop, I, I charge thee, be wary as thou goest, lest thou find thyself mired in heresy. What dost thou mean? I charge thee to make thy meaning clear. Consider a line. The calculus which thou didst invent assumes that this line can be resolved into an infinite number of points of fluxion. But to say a finite quantity of extension consists of parts infinite in number is so manifest a contradiction that everyone at first sight acknowledges it to be so. And it is impossible it should ever gain the assent of any reasonable creature who is not brought to it by gentle and slow degree, as a converted Gentile is brought to the belief in transubstantiation. Thou sayest it, Father, not I. To be sure, I want to put a greatest distance between myself and that remark. For if it were true, then transubstantiation would be learned a deception. And I, as a believer, think it not to be so, but a revelation. A canon in thine own church thinkest differently. And if I be an infidel for asserting there exists such fluxions, then so is he. For did not Nicholas of Cusa write, uh, uh, We wish to find the relation between the area of a circle and its circumference. For simplicity, we suppose that the radius of the circle is one. Now, the circle can be thought of as composed of infinitely many straight line segments, all equal to each other and infinitely short. The circle is a sum of infinitesimal triangles, all of which have altitude one. For a triangle, the sum of the areas of the triangles is half the sum of the bases. But the sum of the areas of the triangles is the area of the circle and the sum of the bases of the triangles is its circumference. Therefore, the area of the circle of radius one is equal to one half its circumference. Be wary now of what thou sayest, lest thou contradict a bishop of thine own church, with whom I concur, and therefore can hardly be an infidel. Thy infinitesimal sum is something that cannot exist but it is contrary to reason. Nicholas of Cusa's argument is easily refuted, as I shall now demonstrate. The base of the triangles of which he speaks must have a length of either zero or something greater than zero. If it be zero, then half the product of the height of the triangle and its base is also zero. If, on the other hand, it be greater than zero, then, no matter how small these segments be, if we add together infinitely many such pieces, we will get an infinite area. This, of course, is what that great mathematician, philosopher, engineer and physicist Archimedes realized so many centuries ago, that an infinitesimal would have to be a number that is greater than zero, but which, nevertheless, remained less than one, no matter how many times it is added to itself. And this defies all rational understanding. And it is impossible that that which defies reason exists. Thou art properly informed that Archimedes claimed there to be a contradiction in the concept of a number which, though greater than zero, nevertheless remained less than one, no matter how many times it be added to itself. Oh, indeed, to this very day. Uh, such numbers are referred to by us by the term non-Archimedean numbers. And the dispute in which we now engage, and which delights us both, for I can tell by thy visage that thou art as delighted by this stimulating discussion as am I, is a controversy over the matter of whether non-Archimedean numbers truly exist, or whether the term is just so much empty wind. But didst thou realize that when Archimedes himself came to solve problems in the geometry of parabolas, 
he relied on intuitions of infinitesimals, or even though when he came to develop his proofs according to those most rigorous standards, the use of which we mathematicians and mature philosophers enjoy, he eliminated all proofs which relied on such intuitions and developed his proofs using the method of exhaustion, which relies on indirect argument and finite construction, well, thinking it absurd to claim that infinitesimals exist. Still, dost thou not think it strange that identical results were achieved by both methods? And, my good Irish father, as thou knowest, we Englishmen have a saying, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. For if the method based on intuitions of infinitesimals works, then why should one not use it? For if it were based on an absurdity, then surely this absurdity would reveal itself in the result. The notion of the infinitesimal is abhorrent to reason, and we have no need of it. I can demonstrate to thee that the area of a circle with a radius of one unit equals half the circumference, using a proof not dependent on the absurd assumption of such entities. Proceed then, sir, for I am eager to hear it. Though I must caution thee that the existence of such a proof does not itself demonstrate the absurdity of such assumptions as thou appearest wont to challenge. Nevertheless, mine ear is thine. Oh my, how tasty is my little Englishman. But we must continue with our labors. We shall argue using an indirect method, a method with which, no doubt, thou art intimately familiar. The proposition that I desire to demonstrate asserts the equality of two quantities associated with a circle with a radius of one, its area and half its circumference. Now, to use the indirect method of demonstration, we assume the contrary of that which we wish to prove. In this instance, that these two quantities be not equal. If these quantities be not equal, then one must be larger than the other. Let A represent the positive number obtained by subtracting the smaller quantity from the larger. Suppose then we circumscribe about the circle a regular polygon of some arbitrary number of sides. We then suppose the number of these sides to increase until the area of the polygon differs from the area of the circle by less than one half the quantity represented by A. And then the area and the semi-perimeter of the circle must differ by less than A. This contradicts our original claim that A is a number representing the difference between the area of the circle and its semi-perimeter. Thus, the assumption that the area of a circle of a radius equal to one unit is less than or greater than its semi-perimeter is false. Therefore, these two quantities are equal. The proof leaves nothing to be desired. Nevertheless, though it proves that the assumption of the infinitesimal is not necessary, it does not show that the assumption is wrong, well, any more than the fact that the statement that God created young boys for the delectation of old men such as myself has no part in this demonstration constitutes a refutation of this delectable truth. Indeed, the assumption of infinitesimals may yet prove useful in other arguments. Why dost thou find the notion of the infinitesimal so abhorrent? Or dost thou not believe that the infinite is the source and the means as well as the unattainable goal of all knowledge? Mathematics is learned by divine inspiration and not by ratiocination. And instinct and intuition alone give testimony as to the nature of the infinitesimal. The infinitely large and the infinitely small are mysteries proposed by God to man not to understand, but to savor. Sir, thy theology is glib, for God gave us reason, too, to learn of his mysteries, and thou art too hasty in ignoring its powers. Let us appeal to reason to discuss thy calculus, and by means of reason expose the work of the devil. Here I seize the privilege of a free thinker, and 
take the liberty of inquiring into the object, principles, and method of demonstration claimed by the mathematicians of the present date. With the same freedom, they presume to treat the principles and mysteries of religion. According to thy calculus, if two quantities differ by an infinitesimal, then they can be considered equal. This reasoning that thou offerest, that the fluxion of a falling body at some fluent can be equated to the average velocity over a small period of time of infinitesimal duration, depends upon this principle, repugnant to all reasoning and obscure to all sense. Forget thou not that, in the bravest mathematics, mores quam minimi, non sunt contravendi. If we neglect a quantity, no matter how small, then we no longer have the exact amount, but only an approximation. I err, though mildly. Why then, cane me, father? Well, I should like to but I have not the authority to do so. And God grants that authority only to those he makes responsible for the well-being of undeveloped creatures. And thy mind, except insofar as its pagan or godless character is concerned, is certainly not undeveloped. Mm, pity, though thanks be for undeveloped boys. Consider me only as an infidel then, father. And be most strict in your administration of corrective discipline. Be firm, I plead with thee. Remember only my infidel beliefs as thou wieldest thy cane. I am flattered to observe how ardently thou desirest to be corrected. I wonder, though, if thou goest not too far. Let us return then to reasoning about the matter at hand. Yes, father. I think thou misrepresenteth my thoughts on fluents and fluxions. By the ultimate velocity of, say, a falling body, I mean that with which the body is moved, neither before it arrives at its last place when the, the motion ceases, nor after, but at the very instant when it arrives. Uh, by, say, light, by the ultimate ratio of evanescent quantities is to be understood the velocities with which they disappear, neither before they vanish, nor after they vanish, but that with which they vanish. And so, when I compute the ratio of increase in speed of a falling body over a period of time, my result I find is 32 plus 16 times the square of the interval of time. I then allow the interval of time to become vanishing small until it reaches zero, and then 32 is the exact answer. It would seem that this reasoning is not fair or conclusive. For when it is said, let the increments be nothing, or let there be no increment, the former supposition that the increments were something, that there were increments, is destroyed. And yet the consequence of that supposition, i.e. the expression got by virtue thereof, is retained. Which is a false way of reasoning. What are these fluxions? The velocities of evanescent increments. And what are these same evanescent increments? They are neither finite quantities, nor quantities infinitely small nor yet nothing. Maybe call them the ghosts of departed quantities. For the present, I am, if not entirely convinced, I am at least silenced. I would fain know what more thou wouldst require in order to be perfectly convinced. Hast thou not had the liberty of explaining yourself in all manner of ways? I am at present so amazed to find myself ensnared that it cannot be expected I should find my way out. Thou must give me time to recollect myself. Ark, is this not the college bell? It rings for prayers. Come along, my little one. We shall kneel together, contemplate the majesty of him who is our lord and master. To him we must submit ourselves in humble devotion. Oh, I thrill at the hour when I can prostrate myself before him.